A quick disclaimer, opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Our guest this week is Mike Perry. Based in Massachusetts, Mike is the founder and co-owner of Skill of Strength Gym, along with his wife, Amanda. He has worked with athletes across many professional disciplines and specializes in training mixed martial arts fighters. Today, we discuss with Mike how he found his way into MMA training, programming for combat athletes, advice for those getting started in multidiscipline fighting, and ideas on optimizing a fighter's movement. And now for the main event with this week's Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. Thanks for tuning in to the Movement Podcast. Today in the studio, we have our host, we have Gray Cook and Dr. Lee Burton. And joining us today, we also have Mike Perry. Mike is a certified strength and conditioning coach. He's also a personal trainer and owner of Skill and Strength Gym outside of Boston. So Mike, thank you for being here today. And if you don't mind, would you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. So I've been a strength and conditioning coach going on 18 years. Yeah. We're lucky enough to have a gym, um, in Chelmsford, Massachusetts called skill of strength. And we're going on our ninth year as well. And, um, I tell you what, my journey has been pretty crazy. I've had a lot of mentors. I've had a lot of people helping me along the way, a lot of people giving me, um, some tough love, uh, throughout my journey, but, uh, it's, it's been pretty, pretty wild over the last decade. And, um, you know, it, it started with just having a, a a huge interest in movement as a young kid and being that hyperactive kid that was always just climbing trees and running around as if I could do anything active, that was, that was what I did. And that just snowballed into being an athlete in high school and in college. And I played college soccer. And, uh, after that, it was just a simple natural progression. I started lifting weights and I started getting interested in it. And, um, the, the progression was odd because I, I was always into strength and conditioning or exercising, but I didn't go to school for that. I actually went to school for criminal justice. So when people ask me about my education, I'm like, yeah, I'm a sociology guy, which doesn't help me with anything really in the strength and conditioning world. But through that journey, I was able to meet a ton of people and being an athlete and being an athlete that was sort of, sort of jacked up a little bit and did things the wrong way. I think one of the main reasons why I was so drawn to just movement and and training in general is because I was wondering why I, I was having these tweaks and these twinges and these issues and I couldn't figure it out. I would work really hard, but I just really couldn't figure things out. So that led me to the journey of just trying to figure out how to fix myself and how to be a, uh, you know, a, a quality strength coach and a personal trainer. And, um, yeah, it, you know, 18 years later, I'm still trying to figure it out. And there's some days I, I feel like I know what I'm doing and other days I'm like, man, I'm just going to go, uh, dig some holes and cut some grass and live the simple life. So yeah, it's uh that's me in a nutshell, but we've been, we've been going strong for nine years. And my wife, she, uh, she does the majority of the work at the gym. Uh, God bless her because she has to put up with me and my antics, but uh, it's been a crazy journey and, and uh, we're, we're pretty happy and pretty lucky. Yeah, Mike, I, I really appreciate you coming on today and having you here um, in Chatham is, is, is awesome. Um, but give me a sense of those early years. I mean, you mentioned the first five years, pretty crazy. What, where's that transition from majoring in sociology, criminal justice, I guess, trying to maybe go into law enforcement or something, mm-hmm. but transitioning into all in to be a, a strength coach? So I finished college and I was, tr- um, I had a few friends that were playing uh, in major league soccer and they were training at a facility called Train Boston Sports Center in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And I got friendly with those guys. And at that point I had played college soccer. I did decently. Um, and I wanted to actually play pro soccer, but I was, I was pretty jacked up and I had a lot of these recurring things, but I was still just really into it. So I decided, um, at a certain point, I'm like, ah, this, this criminal justice thing isn't going to work for me just because at that point there weren't really any jobs. 
and uh, it, it, the timing was off. So I, was, I started training with all these MLS guys and I just got really familiar with them. And then I met the owner of this facility and we, we kind of hit it off. And, and he's like, hey, you ever think about becoming like a strength coach trainer? I'm like, yeah, I've thought about it, but I don't, I don't have um, really the background. Like I'm not your, you know, your, I don't have the formal schooling. And he's like, don't worry about it. He goes, we'll start you as an intern. And, you know, if you can just show up and, and do what we ask. I mean, I was, you know, doing laundry. I was working the front desk. I was doing whatever they asked me to do. And eventually I just started to learn. And, and at a certain point, it was like, huh, maybe, maybe I can do something with this. So, but again, I didn't have that background. So it was just really, I felt like I got a late start, but looking back at it, I think it was a really good start because I, I came in um, and I didn't have any expectations. I didn't know anything. So I was just like a sponge. And, you know, at first I was that guy that just wanted to train hard all the time. And I was, you know, one of the early adopters of CrossFit. Like I was doing my wads in the, you know, in the other room, just murdering myself, doing these just crazy workouts. And that kept me competitive and it, it fed that competitive component of my life, but it also made me <laughs> move a lot, a lot worse and, and, um, and jacked me up a little bit more, but I was always that competitive guy. And then eventually, um, you know, I realized, Hey, I can't be that strength coach that just, you know, beats the crap out of people and gives them a, a beat down every time they come in. Cause some people can withstand that, but obviously over time it's, it's, uh, it's not the best way to train people. So for me, um, I, I kind of learned the hard way, right? Well, let, let me, let me ask a question and, and I'll let Greg ch chime in as well here. Cause I think the people we've had come in to kind of tell us their background, a lot of them have a very similar story, meaning that, you know, you're describing maybe not having that formal education, talking to two guys who've had the formal education, but you stuck your nose in, you figured it out, you did it, learn, learn trial by fire, so to speak. But a lot of what I hear you describing is this, you just worked hard. You, you had the right mentors. You, you educated yourself because you knew you didn't have that formal background. And I think that's the good and bad of this industry, in my opinion, because you do have these others who don't have the formal background, but just because this is what they do, they just assume that's what they should have all their clients do. And I think what you're describing is you had the right mentors and you took it upon yourself to really educate yourself and not just train somebody the way they, they think they should be trained. Two observations I got. <clears throat> Criminal justice pre prepared you to sort of analyze or investigate things. And not having a background in weightlifting, which usually if you're under 20 and you got a back background in weightlifting, it's either powerlifting or bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And both of these things done incorrectly actually hurt movement for another goal. One goal is for shape and the other goal is to post numbers. So when people come to strength conditioning with this obligation to turn everything into a loaded resistance exercise, something heavy with a handle, sometimes they miss the mark. So having the soccer background, I think you're astutely aware of anything that makes you a step slower or doesn't allow you to get low and, and, and stop or something like that. So actually having a, an appreciation of movement, I think creates some transferability and having that investigation, uh, you're working with fighters now. Uh, mm -hmm. Conflict resolution is a great thing to have because when you're telling somebody who can kick your ass easily where their weakest link is, there's a good way to say that and a bad way to say that. Yeah. And, and so I, I think actually coming to strength and conditioning without a weight training bias, there's always going to be space for the weights. One of the compliments I'd like to give you is we had Alan Cosgrove on the show and he and Rachel are a dynamic duo and you guys are too. And the one thing that I hope we get a chance to talk about is in your facility and, and the way Alan has run it with, with Rachel's help is there is an elegance in traffic flow that tells me your philosophy if I lean in and, and I like the way you designed a facility and I like the traffic flow. So at some point, walk us from the front door right back out the front door and let us know that 45 minute investment feels like um, that you've created with this, with this journey. Yeah. So, um, you know, a couple of things is again, with my background, um, like you were saying, you know, hard work, come from a family. My dad was a machinist. He always had a part-time job full-time job and a part-time job. So I blue collar family. And to me, if you didn't know exactly what was going on, your only other option was hard work. That's it. And that's kind of my mentality still. Like I, I'm not the, I'm not the brightest guy in the room. Right. But 
I will work until I understand it. And once I understand it, boom, it's locked in. So for me, when I go after a topic, I'm not, I'm not okay with being mediocre at it. So if I dive into something, whether it's kettlebell, whether it's, um, Olympic lifting, I'm, I'm, I'm in until it's locked in and I can teach it verbatim. So I think that's a big part of it. And that's the way that we actually, you know, run our facility. And that's the way that we do things at, at skill of strength, because I'm very adamant about systems. Like when you come in, the first thing we do is, well, now first thing we do is sign a waiver and do a temperature check and sanitize your hands. <laughs> but besides that, we do, we, we bring people in, we walk them to the front door of the gym and we, we just explain to them how we do things, the check-in process, et cetera. We give them a tour, but then we just sit down with them and explain to them our, our, our system, but we just listen. I think that's the, the one thing that a lot of people say to us is we'll sit down and sometimes we'll spend 75 minutes with them just to get to know them. And, and for us, even if they don't end up becoming a member, they're going to remember the fact that we took the time to listen, to see what was going on because so many people come in and they're like, I want to exercise and I want to do this. And this is what I've been doing. And a lot of the times they come from gyms that don't have any type of screening process whatsoever. They just chuck them into a boot camp and, you know, do, you know, do your Tabatas of this, 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 and this. And it's like, yeah, we don't do that. So a lot of people come in thinking they're going to get their, their, you know, their butts kicked, but that's not what we do. And, um, we educate them the whole way. That's, that's what I always tell my coaches, guys. Yes, we're going to provide them a service that is fitness related, but more importantly, if you spend time at my gym and you've been there for six months, when you leave, whether it's on a vacation or maybe you decide to go somewhere else, you're going to have the skill set to know, Hey, things aren't feeling right. Um, maybe I should be doing this instead. So we find that if we can educate people on how to take care of themselves, how to train, how to make better decisions in and out of the weight room, that's going to improve their quality of life. And that's really what we're trying to do is, is simply give people the tools so they don't need us, which is crazy to think, right? Is that where the name skill of strength came from? That, that thought process? Yes. Uh, so early on, um, where I got skill of strength from, so that was a blog actually that I started when it was like Blogspot days, right? I don't even know if Blogspot's still around, but that was the name of the blog. And that was when I was early getting into kettlebells. And I kept on hearing the strength is a skill thing from, you know, listening to Pavel's work. And I was like, strength is skill of strength. And then I looked and I was like, wait, no one has this name yet. So I took the blog spot and then eventually we, you know, did the, uh, we turned that to the name of our gym. And, um, and that's another thing too, because for us, we feel that strength is that, you know, that, that bowl in which everything else can, can be moved into. And we always tell people strength is a skill. And if you want to learn how to get strong, you have to spend time acquiring that skill. And that is just a big part of what we do. And listen, you know, I've, I'm fortunate enough to work with a bunch of different people. Like I, I had a gentleman that was in his eighties, right. And this guy came in, he's not coming to me saying, Hey Mike, you know, my goal is to, you know, do some high intensity interval training. I, I want to do more Metcons. You know what he said? He's like, I need to be able to get up and down out of my chair, mm -hmm. out of my wheelchair. And I need to be able to walk. So for him, like strength was that underlying foundation of what he needed rarely do people come in saying, I need more high intensity workouts or Metcon. Usually people come in, they're like, Hey, especially in the older population, like I want to be able to pick up my grandkids. Like I want to be able to get in and out of the chair. I want to be able to go and do some weekend activity and not feel like I fell down three flights of stairs because I'm so jacked up. And that's, that's why we're so highly focused on getting people strong because once you're strong and, and if you move well enough, the other stuff is way easier. You just said something that I think if most people look at the people in front of them seeking a different path in their, their fitness, their health, their wellness. If you fast forward what they're asking for, it's one or two things, performance or independence. And I know a lot of your fighters are looking for performance and that's measured in the ring. And this guy was definitely looking for independence. At some point, he's going to get what you need to give him He's never going to forget where he got it, but he may not be investing all of his time in the gym because his time is limited. And he, he wants to do things with this new plateau of fitness you give him. But if you would listen closely, most people will, if they're asking for performance, they will have to give up independence. You will have to be coached and you will have to follow a system. If you're going for independence, you are going to have to learn something along the way if you're ever going to coach yourself. And so I really, I don't, demand that we get there in the first session or even the second talk. But if you know that one, one person's trajectory is headed away from you, 
And one person's trajectory is going to be side by side with you until you either help them fail or succeed. Then I honestly think you'll realize the decisions you have to make fostering more of an education model or more of a very aggressive, hang on, I'm going to coach you through this, but I need your trust and and your faith and and stuff like that. So I I think it's, it's nice for people to at least think about those two buckets first. Half the people are asking you for independence. The other half are asking you for performance. That means the other one has to take a back seat while we do this. And and so setting, I think you do a good job of setting that clear and listening to them first, but then showing them this system will get you to more independence. This system will get you to more performance. Absolutely. No, it's a, and, and a lot of the times it's a combination of both, right? People, again, my goal is if every, Whoever comes and trains with us, if they ever leave or they go somewhere else, they know what to do. And even my fighters, yeah, I can hand my fighters. I've got guys that, pro fighters that I've worked with for seven, eight years. I can hand them a program. They know how to execute it well. But sometimes I just got to get in their face. And especially when it comes to really dialing their conditioning and getting them fight ready, um, you have to get on them and just yell at them and let's go. Like, this is it. Like, you're in a, you're getting locked in a cage and there's person away, you know, across the cage from you is trying to break your limbs is trying to knock you out. And, you know, the conditioning component and, and everything else that goes along with that is so important because a lot of people don't in the MMA world, they, they think they're fit, right? But they're not fit. They're just efficient. So a lot of the times I see it with like a lot of high level black belts in jujitsu too. And, and a lot of guys, and they murder everybody they get, and they, they, they get in, into the, um, on the mats and they do whatever they want. And people are like, oh, they're so fit. I'm like, no, 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 they're not fit. They're efficient. You can't, you cannot confuse efficiency with a highly conditioned athletes because they're two different things. So I think that's a big part of, of what I try to do from an educational standpoint from our fighters is, hey, just because you're winning, it, it doesn't mean that you're fit because you are, as you climb, climb the ladder, you're going you're gonna to find those opponents that are just as efficient. Now what happens? So that's a big thing that I, th- I think people miss a lot. Is just because people are successful, they believe that they're fit, but they're just really damn efficient and they're smarter. And you have to be able to look at that and say, hey, okay, that's a beautiful thing. You give me an efficient athlete and I give them a, uh, you know, more power, more endurance and a bigger gas tank. Now we're cooking with gas, right? And that's a, that's a big part of what I do is trying to extrapolate the information and um, how we can make them better. Because some people from an efficient, they're not efficient, right? And if they're not efficient, you maybe don't need to come see me. Maybe you need to learn how to not get punched in the face, right? Like maybe that's the best part of your camp is not doing more bike sprints. Maybe you need to punch your hands up because this, bike sprints aren't going to fix the punch to the face, right? It just doesn't work that way. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting working with those types of athletes, but uh, I feel like giving them the independence and having them trust the process is super important. But at the same time, sometimes you got to get in their face and yell at them. No, I, I like that, and and you're helping them prepare for their opponent, and you do it in a different way than your 80 year old. His opponent's gravity, <laughs> but you can't get in his face. You got to basically let him learn learn those lessons along the way. But no, I think that's that's good because the fact that you can work with both those people uh, equally demonstrates the the latitude of where you're willing to meet movement. Some people only want to be in a very narrow lane of movement. And the problem is by not being able to cross those lines and barriers and, and understand different goals in movement, you do limit um, your accessibility to the general public. And when we have little curveballs like society's given us right now, if you've got a very narrow lane, sometimes you'll have a traffic jam before you know it and you won't get to serve as many people as you easily could. Yeah. And, and for a lot of people, and you mentioned that and the analogy I use when people come in, especially if they move poorly is, hey, right now. You're driving your car down a one lane road and you're banging into shit all the time. My goal is to give you more lanes. So if you swerve a little bit, you may not hit something. And that's a good thing. We're trying to give you that buffer zone. So if you do overstep what you're capable of, you're not going to be jacked up. So I always tell them, hey, listen, I'm just trying to give you some more lanes. So when you do screw up, it's not going to be catastrophic. It's going to be a minor, a minor bump in the road. And then we can just move on and continue to train. All right. Who met you there in your functional journey? Who basically said, yeah, you used to be an athlete, you know, your way around, around the weight room. And here's four things you had no idea of. When was that for you? Because I found that most people who have sat in this room, sat in these chairs and had these conversations, they had to embrace a lot of what we talk about personally before you could ever envision it professionally. So when was your point of humility? 
<laughs> well, so <laughs> we could do a whole podcast on um, just the one on that. I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I would say there's there's two different times where it happened. And one was in college because I, I went in and I remember going in and I was I could I ran a three mile and under. 18 minutes and I was fit as a fit. I mean, I, I thought I was in the best shape of my life, but I went in and I was, I was going through and I was just gassing out and I'm like, what's wrong. I'm like, and I talked to my coach and my coach just didn't really know. And the athletic trainer didn't really know. Looking back at it, I was just training the wrong way. I was doing like pushups and sit-ups and just running long distance, which yeah, I got my three mile time down. But from a, from a soccer standpoint, it was, it was a waste of time really. Um, so that was one thing going, I thought I did it right. And then uh, the next time was uh, one of my early mentors. His name was BJ Baker. And this was a guy that he was, um, he was actually a strength coach at the Red Sox as well uh, okay. in the early days. So he was at the days of, uh, he worked with Clemens and Pedro and, and Manny and all those guys. And he was, he was the guy that made me aware of the fact that I, even though I could lift heavy things and move things in that nice sort of uh, on those, on train tracks, there's some other things that I just couldn't do. And I remember like when I first started taking a class and we were warming up and even just like the warm up, and it was just a dynamic warm up. It was the old uh, core performance from Verstegen. You know, you do your toe touches. I mean, uh, your, your toe walks, your heel walks, your knee to chest, your walking quad. And I remember doing that and I didn't, I'm like, it's a warm up, but I remember doing that. I'm like, man, I feel so much better. Like, I didn't know why at first, but I'm like, I felt that much better. And then, so I started doing that. I'm like, oh, there's something to this warm up thing. And then, and then I remember doing a bunch of just like core training, like, and it was just like, like active leg lowers and planks. And I remember being like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Like I could squat and deadlift, but I'm like, you, they had me doing chops and lifts and this core stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, why the hell can't I do this? Like I can, I can do everything else. So well, but these little intricate things, I was just, it, they kicked my ass. And I was like, what the hell's going on? And that's when, um, this guy, BJ was like, Hey man, you just, you know, you get, there's a lot of things you need to fix. And at that point too, I had, you know, a couple, couple injuries as well. And I'm like, something's got to give. And that was sort of the, the point in my career. I'm like, yeah, just adding more horsepower at this point is not the answer because all that's doing is making my low back hurt and my hip hurt. And, uh, I finally had to completely change the way that I do things because it was not working. And all of these little nagging injuries were starting to add up. And, and that was when I really started to just dive in and go, what, what the hell's going on with me? Cause I really, I, I didn't have this background. I literally did not even know. I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what was wrong. And that was how my educational process started because they were just like, all right, you're going to do this, 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 and this. And then eventually, you know, led to, uh, taking my first FMS and and I started to slowly understand the system. Still, there's days that I, I wonder if I even still understand it or know it, but that's another conversation. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're actually going to dive deeper into Mike's experience uh, training professional fighting athletes. Performance is a goal for many clients and is the foundation for all skill-based sports and activities. The fundamental capacity screen is a straightforward, efficient, and repeatable method to measure four essential movement capacities motor control, postural control, explosive control, and input control are simply restated as the developmental movements of climbing, carrying, running, and jumping. Once movement competency is established with the functional movement screen, the FCS is the stepping stone between the functional movement patterns and skill-based coaching. The FCS demonstrates ways in which the four fundamental capacities affect sport and physical activity and provides a baseline measure enabling professionals to know where to focus training to reach higher goals. Get started today and find a course near you. So I think my first question after that first segment where you went from soccer and then we've been talking about these pro fighters, how did that transition happen going from the soccer training facility to being so successful at training fighters? Well, um, so again, I grew up playing soccer, but I was always the active kid. I mean, we played every sport in the neighborhood. We, we had this big neighborhood. There was probably like 15, 20 kids and we would do every single thing. And a lot of the times it ended up in, in fights and it ended up us uh, beating the hell out of each other. And, you know, th literally we would have rock fights. Like kids don't do that these days anymore. Um, <laughs> but I also took uh, karate when I was real young and, and, uh, all of my neighbors did as well. And, you know, it was funny because I was super hyperactive and I was pretty much a pain in the ass my whole childhood. And, um, I took karate and I remember 
I loved it, but I remember getting in a, like a fight in the neighborhood and I, for, I forget exactly what happened, but I think I ended up like beating up a kid or something. And my parents are like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have you learn to injure one another when you're, when you can't pay attention and you get a lot of energy. So, but I always had that appreciation for martial arts growing up. And even when, uh, you know, watching even like wrestling and, and watching the early days of the UFC, I was just always drawn to it. And I'm, I wasn't sure why, but there was something that primal about watching two guys get in a cage and beat the hell out of one another. And I, uh, I really just appreciated that. But so when I was, when I was playing soccer and even my early years as a strength coach, I was lucky enough to work with, I probably had about 20, 25 guys in the MLS that I, uh, that I worked with. And there was developmental contracts at that point. So a lot of guys, if they were recruited from, you know, a higher level school, they would go and they'd get a contract in MLS. But a lot of these guys had these developmental contracts where they basically had to go in and you'd have to try out every year. And if you did well in your tryouts, you would get like a one year or potentially a two year contract. So for me, a lot of these guys would come to me and be like, hey, listen, I'm on this developmental contract. I need to show up to camp ready. And so they'd come and train with me. And, and again, I didn't, I'll be honest, I really didn't know <laughs> that much about training people, but I, I knew that there were certain char characteristics of soccer that were harder than others. So I always knew that cutting and change of direction were the most taxing things. Running in a straight line wasn't that hard. It was that small um, multi-directional movement stuff. So what I did was I just took the stuff that was the hardest physically and I focused on cleaning that up first and then added on that long distance stuff after. So I had a lot of success with these MLS guys. They were all going into camp. They were all, you know, winning their conditioning tests and doing really, really well. And um, I got to a certain point where I had to leave. Uh, this was my second job and, and I decided to open my own gym, but I still had this, I love working with pro athletes. So I still had this little uh, itch that needed to be scratched. And I was uh, hosting an HKC kettlebell course at my gym. And this was gosh, I don't even remember how long ago, but it was the HKC days. And I had met a Muay Thai instructor there. And he worked at the school in Boston called Sityatong Boston, which is a, you know, a, a school that has been around for quite some time. And they're known for their Muay Thai and MMA. And he said, we just, we kind of hit it off at the kettlebell uh, course. And, and I said to him, Hey, um, if, if you ever have a pro fighter that, you know, wants to do some strength and conditioning, let me know. Um, I'd love to work with them. Um, I'd love to have the opportunity to train some fighters. And he says, you know what? I got a guy for you. Um, he's like a two in one pro. His name is Rob Font and, uh, he's, he's coachable. He's a good guy. And that was my first, uh, that was my first fighter that I ever worked with. And now he's the number nine bantamweight in the UFC right now, which is pretty cool. And I've been with him for eight years. So, um, and then it just snowballed. He started doing well and all the other guys started doing well. And, and now I, I think I've got maybe six to eight guys that I'm working with in the UFC, then another stable of, uh, whether they're professional, you know, grapplers, jujitsu guys, or, uh, you know, up and coming MMA guys. So it's, it's been a pretty crazy journey. Is that primarily right now who you, who you personally are, are working with or focusing on just that, that type of client? So right now the, I would say that the three buckets that I, I work with are the three clientele, uh, population groups that I work with are fighters. Um, two would be youth athletes, um, elementary school and middle school kids. And, um, just like rehab stuff, people coming out of physical therapy or, um, a lot of the people that get sent to me are because they got a back thing or a shoulder thing. And they, they went to three different PTs and for some reason things weren't working or even like the low back stuff. I mean, someone come in and I'm like, so what have you been doing your rehab? I said, has it been like bird dogs and has it been clamshells and has it been glute bridges? I, that's pretty much all I did. And I'm like, okay, there's, there's more to what's going on than, your bird dogs and your clamshells and your glute bridges. So it's definitely the, the transition from rehab back to, you know, normal function fighters and, and kids. So I get a little bit of everything. Well, yeah, you know, if we, if fight, we, fighters are pretty much between rehab and function all the time all because the time. of the nature of the sport. But I heard you do something and I want you to take this right into fighting. Cause I think it'll answer questions for Lee and I both. You knew what not to do with a soccer player, mm -hmm. right? They don't need more time in linear speed. Uh, of all the things we're not going to do today, that is not going to command any real estate from this precious time and energy. Now, what do kids not need and what do fighters not need? Seriously, that, that, because I honestly think that so many people in the exercise industry feel like they've got to do equal time to push, pull, squat, lunge. They've got all these things they want to do. Wait, you already encapsulated the environment of soccer and said, this is what soccer's not begging for. 
Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't look anything like the Boston Marathon, okay? But but I think you've also done that with kids and fighters, and knowing what they don't need allows you to really finally pick out what they are going to need within that environment and depending on who they are. Yeah, it's, it's really trying to find the minimum effective dose of what these individuals need. Um, because again, it's I used to be that guy that would write a program, and their block A would, I mean, you look at the, the program, there'd be 5,000 things on there. And I'm like, man, a lot of this stuff is just useless. So um, for me, I think that one of the reasons why we've been successful with a lot of these groups is simply because of that is I, I'm, I'm pretty good at trimming the fat and just discarding the things that we don't need. And, um, you know, once we get into a groove, I feel like I just get better and better at that. And it allows me to make better decisions. But, you know, again, you, like working with fighters, like you have to realize that yes, strength and conditioning is important, but at a certain point, it isn't that important because it, you know, we're not, we're not trying to see who's the best at exercising, right? I mean, these guys have to go in the cage and fight. And if you can convince me that getting them from a 300 pound deadlift to a 400 pound deadlift is going to make them win a fight. Cool. I'm all ears, but nine times out of 10, that doesn't matter. So a lot of the things it that we also have, change their body weight. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so you've got a body weight constraint where I got to make somebody as strong as possible, but I don't get to use mass to get there. I've got to basically use a strength skill, mm-hmm. not strength tissue. Well, when uh, you say minimum effective dose, what are you, what are you getting at? Give, give us an example of that. So, um, for example, it, well, it depends on where they are in camp, specifically for fighters. Like if I have a 12 week camp, that gives me a lot of time to really build that bigger foundation. But let's, I mean, there's so many times where guys get called up and they're like, Hey, listen, I just got offered a fight in five weeks. And I have to design a program for them that is going to allow them to come to my gym two to three days a week. They can't be sore, right? They can't walk around and be like, oh man, that leg day killed me. It's, they, they can't do it. So I have to figure out a way that I can improve their movement quality, keep them healthy, um, get them stronger, dial in their conditioning, but also have them to be prepared for their other skill training sessions. And that's where I have to look at my programming. I have to just simplify. It's like, hey, here's our power block. Here's our strength block. Here's our um, our energy system development, our movement based stuff. And then we have to go on. But I mean, we can't, I can't s- take these guys through a, a, you know, a 15 minute foam roller session and then a, a 30 minute mobility session. And then it, w- they got to get in and out because first of all, you know, time is precious, but these guys are doing triple sessions. So from a programming standpoint, it's just eliminating a lot of the fluff. And the, the, the hard part about training fighters is you write this program, you're like, this is a good one. And then they come in the next day, they're like, yeah, I, I got arm barred, my elbow's jacked up. It's going to probably take me two weeks to get better. And you're like, oh shit, now I got to completely retool the program. So. Well, and I think what you're describing, Mike, is, is where it's much more of an art than a science to what a good strength and conditioning coach should be doing. And I've said that a lot is you can, and that goes back to formal training. You can get caught up in reading all the books, all the research articles. But at the end of the day, the guy just walked in and got arm barred yesterday. And he's got a fight in five weeks. All that shit goes out the window. You got to figure it out. It's, it's problem. You know what it is? I think one of the things that drives me is problem solving. Give me a scenario that a lot of people can't figure out. And that's where I'm going to thrive. Because for me, if someone comes in and like, I need to lose five pounds. I'm like, mm, cool. Like just eat less right? Like seriously, not that that's not important, but for me, that doesn't stimulate me. I need something where that's one of the reasons why I love training fighters, because you got to get them in the best shape of their life and they're cutting weight at the same time. You know, you, you use a lot of what you learned as a competitive advantage, not as over restriction. I think a lot of times the first time people hear you, me, Lee, the rest of us talking about movement screening, we do have some responsibility there. But on the flip side of that, it's a competitive advantage. Knowing where they can't go today, but where they can go today is a great way to use the time of today. And and not knowing that, like if I had done a screen on you before somebody showed you a half kneeling chop, I'd already told you this is going to be way harder than your last bench press or deadlift, especially when your left knee is down. How did you know that? Because I screened you. And so that awareness that you had when you met functional exercise could have easily been explained to you in advance with a 10 minute screen. And that is the way that, that we often use it, introducing you to that corrective that changes you in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes and allows us to do something in the workout we couldn't have done without that. I honestly think you're taking a lot of the rules and regulations that most people think limit their exercise choices 
and you're using them to get to the real only things that are going to make a difference today anyway and set us up for tomorrow's success. Yeah, I mean, so the way that I use the screen with my fighters is we obviously have our initial screen, but I'm, I'm basically screening them every time they're coming in, not a full screen, but we're looking at stuff because again, it's so taxing on their body. And, and every, every time they come in, something's up. I mean, <laughs> they never come in, like feel great. And I'm like, if they did, then it's just, it's a, it's a fluke, right? So for me, I, what I do is I just take that information. And when you have your, your client stepping into the cage, trying to fight someone, you can't be focusing on correctives. It, you have to build them up as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. So again, I look at, when I look at the screen, yeah, I, the things that I try to focus on are one, what can we quickly correct? What can we, you know, make a a quick impact on? And then secondly, what can we at least maintain so it doesn't get worse? But at the same time, then we have to build all of those other components of their strength and conditioning program, because again, they're, they're fighting. They need it to be in incredible shape. So you can't get stuck in that corrective exercise world. It just, it's not, it's not a viable option. So you fix what you can make sure things don't get worse and then train the hell out of them because they're, they're going to fight someone. Most fitness people don't worry about wasting calories because so many people that they train are in a sedentary lifestyle and don't do enough. Whereas you've got some guys and you're worried about burning them out. And the last thing your workout can be is a beat down because that's exactly what their sport is. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of us have gotten very loose with throwing calories at non-skill. And everything's a skill, right? Everything you're getting ready to do with your body at some point can be appreciated as a skill in your hobby, in your life, and in your daily living. And so wasting calories on an unnecessary exercise, you ain't fighting weight. Yeah. Right. Uh, weight's not a problem. They already got their weight class and a slight deviation either way. Too much muscle or not enough uh, hydration is going to basically mess up everything else. So I just I just think that a lot of us came off of a few generations of exercise is fine. We got to waste these calories because we're sedentary. Uh, not so much when it counts. Yeah. So it- the hard part again about working with these with these individuals is there's just so many moving variables and literally every day is like you have to have that conversation with them and their skill coaches and you know what does the next session look like because I always think about what is their next training session look like not what I'm doing is are they going to be okay to train tonight or tomorrow because again does my deadlift really matter or do we need to make sure that they know how to you know block a kick or stuff a takedown so I also have to step back and say, listen, my job is important. I'm I'm the guy that keeps them healthy. But at the same time, sometimes I just have to say, you know what, man, you're fit. You're good. You need to work on these other things. So um, you have to basically make sure they've got your training is all designed to make sure they have the foundation to go train and improve their skill mm -hmm. at a higher level. Right. That's really what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. And and I think the one misconception people think if, when they start training with a fighter, right? If you don't have experience training with a fighter, you think these guys are animals. We're going to come in and they fight. So their training must replicate what happens in the cage. And it couldn't be further from the truth, actually, because whether you're training pro fighters or you're training MMA guys, jujitsu guys, when you're rolling, when you're grappling, you're competing, it's a very unpredictable, chaotic environment. Your strength and conditioning program should be the opposite. It should be predictable and non-chaotic. And for me, that allows me to create more durable and resilient athletes. Because if they're getting hurt on my time, if they jack them their back up because we went too heavy, that's on me now, right? But, you know, so you have to, you have to pick and choose what the most important things you need to focus on are. But for me, it's simply... Again, we just got to keep them as healthy as possible and as predictable as possible because fighting is, I mean, I had a guy that tore his ACL a year ago in the, the first round and he fought, he fought two more rounds and he won the fight, but it's like, it's just crazy to see when adrenaline's going and it's, uh, I tell you what, it's, it's, it's an amazing to see what the body's capable of. But again, you just can't have too much unpredictable chaos in someone's training world because they will, they will get injured. They're going to get injured. You know, uh I think back to to watching videos of Bruce Lee move and watching videos of Muhammad Ali move, realizing that neither of these guys really had a full-time strength coach. They had a lot of people advising them, but they knew their bodies so well, they just didn't make a lot of bad exercise decisions. And uh, this, this dates me a little bit, but there's a 
movie that any of us can watch on YouTube right now. It's called Choke. And it's about, uh, uh, was it Horse Gracie, Um, who was very much self-trained. He didn't seem to have a strength coach either. But halfway through that movie is him on the beach going through this movement little ritual dance. And I'm blown away. I'm blown away that he figured out that that little kata, that little um, exploration of movement is a perfect way to reset himself, but also a way to screen himself. And, and for anybody who, who is leaning into the, the fighting arts, don't just look at what we're doing now. You have to go back and help a lot of your athletes embrace what Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali learned the hard way. I can't waste time and exercise. And I think a lot of us need to, need to consider that. If you do have a goal, if you do have something, exercise can waste a lot of your time. So, yeah, I mean, if you look at a lot of the the top athletes in the world, they, they move so effortless. It's 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 beautiful to watch. I mean, um, and a lot of people would would um, kind of you know joke about Conor McGregor, who's a guy that you know he's obviously a probably the most recognized name in the world, but he would do a lot of these movement exploration things with um, uh, what's the gentleman's name, Ido. I forget the gentleman. I know who name. you're talking about. I've, I've seen I've seen some of his stuff. And and it, at first it, it does, at first when I saw it, I'm like, this is kind of silly, right? But but then I realized all of those those sort of movement exploration, those intricate moments of which he's just he's having fun. That is actually going to carry over to to martial arts because martial arts and and the world of fighting is just again it's so unpredictable. So if you if you explore movement. And you know how your body moves and whether you're rolling, you're tumbling, you're doing, you know, somersaults and cartwheels. Those those are little bits of skill that you can put into your your movement map. Right. And you're listen, when you're fighting and you're grappling and you're you're put in weird angles and you're put in weird positions. So you have to have a, a ton of movement uh, variability and movement competency or else you're you're going to get hurt. And you're I've seen guys like literally just do some basic warm up drills and they tweak things. And that's because yeah. they, they didn't go through that exploration. I mean, you know, we've all we all know a cat can land on its feet. Now, when they're in the air, they won't tell you whether they're going to rotate to the left or right. All they know is I'm going to land on my feet. And, and a lot of times that's what we see. How'd you do that? They can't tell you how they got there, but it, they had those options and they had explored them through some type of warm up or kata, and so those neural pathways were open. And a lot of us have a tendency to avoid those things that are difficult. And not everything I think a lot of these athletes do were easy. But on the fifth pass through that Turkish getup, oh, it's easy now. And 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 I think a lot of people just have a tendency to avoid that or feel like they got to invest months to make it better. And sometimes you can make it better just on the second pass, on the third pass, just by reorganizing yourself and not waiting for yourself to get strong, but taking the opportunity to get yourself better aligned. What's your state of readiness? And and that's where I've gotten back to with a lot of our balance tests and some of the others. Um, and that's what you're doing when you're screening a lot of your most intense people very, very frequently. Their state of readiness fluctuates more than somebody who's just on a 30-pound weight loss journey. So, Well, Mike, how do you, we're talking a lot about training and movement, but how much do you manage or discuss the other facets that get them prepared, like nutrition and mindfulness, all the things that are being thrown around now more holistic. Do you dive into that? Do these guys have a team of people around them, like a lot of pro athletes? Yeah. So generally, when we're working with the higher level guys, we've got a um, strength coach, striking coach. Um, their manager a lot of the time is involved, and, and maybe their grappling coach. A lot of the times they have two to three corners. Um, usually it's three corners. But usually they have, uh, you know, a striker, a grappler, then maybe like a head coach that is kind of like a general contractor that kind of oversees everything. So for me, it's always, I mean, we've got daily texts going on. You know, what, what you know, how is so-and-so looking? What do we need to focus on? It's really a, a team effort. Um, but really what, I guess my job is I kind of, I'm the the guy that helps manage the the workload and the volume and the injuries. I, we have a lot of things going back and forth, like, hey, how did so-and-so look? Um, he looked like crap. Well, how come? Like, what do we need to do? What can we do on our end? And a lot of the times it's just simply like, listen, you need to get eight hours of sleep. Like, right. So you may, you, may even, you may be the one making the referral to a therapist or mm-hmm. a massage. Hey, you need to go get a massage today. So you're kind of managing 
all of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I make a lot of recommendations. Luckily, one of my clients, um, she's a, she fights Muay Thai, but she's also uh, got a doctorate in physical therapy and she's a very uh, talented clinician and she'll, she'll actually go and she'll, you know, I'll say uh, her name is TK. It's like TK, go see so-and-so and she'll, and actually go to their homes and she'll take care of them. So it's, it's literally a team scenario because if it's just like a little, you know, little things that I can probably help manage cool. But if they've got some legitimate things going on, I'm, I'm referring them out because it's just out of my wheelhouse. Right. But a lot of the times we just got to, we got to get everybody on the same page to make sure, again, they're ready for that next session. But for me, it's more about really keeping them healthy. And then uh, the big thing that I try to give them advice on is, is more so just getting sleep and not, a lot of these guys just stay busy, but they're staying busy because they think they're being productive. They're not actually being productive. They're just being busy and they're wasting time. They go to a class and they, you know, they, they kind of screw around for an hour. It's like, well, what did you get out of that class? Yeah, you didn't get anything out of that class. So why did you even go? Right. So I'm trying to explain to these guys, like if you're going to train, there needs to be a goal and a purpose with every session that you do. Um, And that's going to allow you to have more time to rest, recover, but not waste time. Because a lot of these guys are they get anxious and they get so busy. So they feel like I should do this and I need to do this. And they add more and more and more. And my thing is maybe you should actually take out some things and maybe you should just get some more sleep because that, you know, you don't need three sessions a day. You know, you, you said something about every soccer player needs deceleration and direction change. And mm-hmm. so you don't do anything that would interrupt that. I think every fighter benefits from their best balance and their best reaction time. And believe it or not, rest and regen will hurt your balance and reaction time more than you can train that back up in a single session or five sessions. So one bad night's sleep and one bender that causes dehydration can affect your your balance and your reaction time for about three days. And the only thing you can do to measure it better is rest and regen better. There is no training that you can do to create that that uh, central nervous system balance as good as the sleep, the hydration, the nutrition, and manage your moods. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up here and ask you this question, Mike. I mean, do you see now that UFC MMA has become really mainstream. I mean, it's it's on all the time. I mean, I, they may even have an entire t- network dedicated to it now. I mean, I'm assuming more people are just doing it as a hobby, you know, getting in the ring and, and rolling around. What are some of the advice you could give some of these guys who aren't professionals? Like you mentioned, what made me think of is you mentioned the doctor of physical therapy who is also a fighter. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm kind of making an assuming that, that she does it more on the side. Like a, like a hobby, something that maybe just helps her out that she likes to do. One, first question is, do you see that happening more and more? And then two, what advice would you give some of those people that it just, hey, I just like getting in there and rolling around the gym? Well, so I think the sport of Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been just, it has exploded over the last, I would say, five to seven years. And, and more and more people are, are learning, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is an awesome it's an amazing sport. I mean, I've been, I've been doing it for five years now and I, and I try to compete as much as possible. But the biggest thing that I see is people go in and they train. And when you start off your white belt and you do, you just, you know, you you drill. And then eventually when you start rolling and sparring, you get, you just get your ass kicked and you are the nail for a while. (laughs) And what happens is people think, well, I need to, you know, I want to get my stripes on my belt, right? I want to get to that next belt. So they, they go to all these classes but they're just slowly destroying their bodies. That's what's happening because it's, again, it's, it's a chaotic environment and they go in a lot of the times like, Oh, I heard, you know, jujitsu is great for losing weight. I'm like, eh, it's not. Yeah. It's a byproduct because you suck and your energy expenditure is so high that you lose weight because you just, you're so inefficient. That's why you lose weight. There's nothing magical. I can give you other. You're wrecking your body at the same time. I can give you other inefficient things to make you burn calories that aren't going to jack you up. But so many of these guys, they want to. I'm like, how many times you're on the mat a week? Five days a week. Cool. I'm like, how much time do you dedicate to like recovery? And they're like, what? You know, I got a massage gun. I'm like, that's no, that's not recovery. That's a that's a hundred and fifty dollar (laughs) tool that you stick in your hip when you've overtrained. Right. So I think a lot of these people, what they need to do is they need to start learning about moving well and, and build up their movement competency and just get a little bit stronger. And that's going to keep them on the mats. The problem is, is they look at the next belt and they look at stripes is like, this is where I got to go. And it's like, well, listen, yeah, I know you want to work your way up and maybe get to the point of maybe being a black belt one day, but almost every black belt that I've ever trained and worked with is jacked up and has a lot of injuries because they don't take care of themselves along the way because they think more is better. 
And they think, well, if I, if I want to make it to that next level, I should be here five days a week. And I'm like, well, sure, you can do that. But tell you what, I train two to three days a week. And it's simply because I found that two to three days two to three days a week for me allows me to get better. It allows me to have productive sessions, but stay healthy. And for me, that's, that's my recipe. And I think a lot of people just think more is better when it comes to attending classes and doing more, but these guys are all dealing with, you know, ankles and knees and hips and low backs. And, um, if they just spent a little bit of time cleaning those things up, it's going to make their career that much longer. So when it comes to these injuries and you mentioned multiple times that sometimes you go back to doing screen movements, maybe not the entire screen, but some of it, what have you found? Are there any like commonalities when it comes to asymmetries or things that pop up on the screen with these fighting athletes specifically? Yeah. So ankle, ankle mobility is a huge one with these guys. And, and part of it is, I think that, you know, you're, whether you've played, you know, field and court sports your whole life and you've rolled your ankle or there's submissions in which we try to basically, it's called a toe hold. We try to laterally invert your ankle and try to shred the ligaments. And a lot of these guys, they won't tap, right? They'll, they're going to show how tough they are. And you know, I've, I've, I've rolled with guys before I get them in a toe hold and I start cranking all of a sudden it sounds like someone's ripping a sheet and then they're like, ah, and I'm like, well, why didn't you tap? Like, that's why Lee's never been injured in a fight. A lot of times he's tapping. No, Lee doesn't. Starts. Lee doesn't get in fights. He's not injured in fights. Lee doesn't get into fights. I would say lower extremity issues, though. I, I, I see. Well, from a limitation standpoint, definitely ankles. I see everybody's ankles are just gunked up. Um, a lot of knee injuries, and it's simply because, again, uh, you know, a lot of the leg, a lot of the attacks and grappling, you can get rolled up on your knee, and things can happen in shoulders. And these guys, you know, if you look at the the fighting posture, it's that chin tucked ribs down, arms in to try to try to protect your body, right? So that's an advantageous posture and that's an adaptation for fighting, but it's a really piss poor adaptation for a healthy life, right? Because it's, it's literally the equivalent of being, being on your phone the whole time, right? You're in this sort of armadillo. <laughs> yeah, ex that's exactly it. So a lot of the times we have to undo, not, not so much undo, but in order to keep them healthy, we have to get them out of their fighting posture, which means we got to work on T-spine mobility. We need to work on, um, you know, scap scapular motor control. We need to really get some better reflexive firing of the cuff. Like we need to essentially overbuild their upper back. And I, I always tell people I train, I train my fighters like pitchers because it's very taxing on the upper body. Um, it's, it's a sport that requires a lot of speed, a lot of velocity, but we need to essentially overbuild certain parts of their body because if we don't, they, they're going to get screwed up. And that's, that's how I really try to approach training my fighters. I think that's a big misconception. Anytime you're dealing with a highly skilled individual, the assumption is that if they're a thrower, you've got to make sure you build up the, the muscles that throw. When mm -hmm. in actuality, they're doing that all the time anyway. Yeah. You got to almost do just the opposite. And Gray uses the analogy of just swing the opposite way that what you're doing normally. If, I, if you got a golfer that swings to the to the left, right-handed golfer, maybe you should swing the opposite way a little bit. Same type of concept. Yeah. Well, people just think they need to replicate the exact exercises that they do day in and day out. And like you said, they're already getting enough of it, right? Like if you're if you're already eating enough vegetables, man, maybe just try a steak. At a certain point, you need to change it up and you know, with, with specifically with these, these combat athletes, it's everybody wants to do sports specific training. And it's like, listen, you're already doing your sport enough. You need just some really good solid GPP because that's going to actually help your specific training down the road. Well, the, the one other thing you said, you, you identified ankles, you identified knees and shoulders. There's two ways. I think we all look at this and I want to make sure everybody hears that you can have a knee problem, even though I don't see it in a movement screen, right? I know you got a vulnerable knee, but you're functionally intact. And as long as we're screening you, I can't see the knee. But there are also people, we can see those ankles every time we screen them. So it's, it's important to understand that every sport has a few body parts that it will exploit. But if I can't see that body part on the screen, you're doing a good job. Yeah. With the global movements that you, you did some local strengthening, you've got to make those ankles tougher. So a little bit of jump rope, <laughs> some, some plyos actually create that tendon ligament integrity. But if I can see your local problem on a global movement, we got two problems. You got a vulnerable spot and now you're telegraphing your movement and you can't tap into the things that this clean pattern would give you in your adaptability and in your sport.
I think we need to look at things that way because it's really easy to take every sport and stack up the body parts that fail first, pitcher's elbow, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if we can see that problem in a, in a whole body movement pattern in a screen, you got two problems. Yeah. What I always do is I always relate the screen to something else in their sport. So we talk about ankle mobility. Um, why is that important? I'm like, okay, show me a takedown. Show me when you shoot for a double or a single. How do you break that down? And of course, they're in a split stance. They level change. You know, they drop to the floor and they have to use that active loaded ankle dorsiflexion and then extension of the great toe and then they shoot, right? I'm like, listen, you're, you're, the fact that you have such limited ankle dorsiflexion, you know when you go to shoot and you smash your knee on the ground every single time? That's not, that's not doing you any good uh, from a health standpoint. It's just not. So this is why having great ankle mobility and having good extension of the great toe is going to not only help you with your, your overall health and function, but it's going to actually apply to a specific exercise in your sport. So I think having, you know, educating these athletes on the relationship between how we screen and how we look at movement and then bringing it right back to your sport and saying, Hey, listen, you know, when you do this, this is why, this is why we do this. And this is how it relates. And, uh, that's what I try to do with a lot of my, especially with my grapplers. Like you look at, um, certain submissions that are, you know, basically trying to break people's arms. It's like, Hey, listen, you know, there's, there's these submissions called an Americana and a Kimura, which is essentially, um, very similar to what we do in the movement screen. You're looking at, you know, shoulder flexion, you're looking at external rotation and you're looking at shoulder extension, internal rotation. Well, listen, if those are limited and someone grabs your arm and you have such severe limitations on those movement patterns, you're going to get tapped earlier and your chances of actually getting injured are going to increase because you move like shit. So be like water. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for being here. It was a joy to have you in the studio with us here in Virginia. We really appreciate it. Yeah, Mike, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yep. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.